Hello, I'm assuming we're, we're, we're ready to start. Yes. Or, okay. Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Melker Hall. I am a faculty member in human and organizational development. Um, and we have two uh, esteemed panelists today. I'm going to read um, short bios about them, um, both from University of District of Columbia, um, which, which is an important sort of partner with Fielding, as, you, as many of you know. First, we have uh, Dr. Sabine O'Hara, and I'm just going to read a little bit about her. She's a teacher, mentor, researcher, and administrator committed to improving lives in underserved communities. She currently leads an innovative PhD program in urban leadership and entrepreneurship at the University of the District of Columbia, which is the only public university in Washington, D.C., and the only exclusively urban land-grant university in the United States. Prior to her current appointment, she served as Dean of the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Sciences, Causes, and led the university's efforts to build a cutting-edge model for urban agriculture and urban sustainability that integrates training in the agriculture, environmental, and health sciences with the practical aspirations of students and residents to embark on successful careers in the green economy. Welcome, Dr. O'Hara. Thank you. Next, we have, and I'm going to pre present them both because they have a, a, a shared presentation that, that weaves, into, <laughs> weaves into the other. Next, we have Dr. Benson Cook. He's a professor of counseling and psychology and clinical coordinator for the graduate mental health counseling program at the University of the District of Columbia in Washington, DC. He is a prolific author and popular speaker who has addressed diverse audiences at national and international conferences, symposiums, workshops, professional institutes, and local and national radio and television programs. The author of numerous journal articles, magazine articles, and book chapters, Cook wrote and co-authored five textbooks titled Personal Empowerment for People of Color, Keys to Success in Higher Education, All About Depression, and socioeconomic and education factors impacting American political systems, emerging research and opportunities, selected aspects of mentoring, advice, challenges, and approaches, and all about depression, issues, treatment, and resources, which is in its second edition. I am also going to put links into um, into the into the chat box so that you all can read more about both of these scholars who have um, a. a a, a tremendous background that that this is just a small slice of. I also want to say that um, Gail Wilson, who is a HOD student, is here with us, um, and she will be helping me to moderate this panel and and looking out for questions. Hello. <laughs> Um, and then we also have Andrea McKenna and Enid Osborne, who are lovely fielding staff who are helping us to, to coordinate today's events. And so um, with that, I will pass it on to our speakers. For those of you who are not accustomed to the webinar format, we're going to ask you to, you can put in your questions, but we're going to give the, the panelists dedicated time to speak, and then we'll field questions at the very end. Thank you and welcome. Well, thank you for this uh, very generous introduction, Dr. Hall. It's a pleasure to be here, Ms. Wilson. Great to see you too. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about my favorite topic, namely local, localized, community-based economic development with a focus on food and food system. So here it goes. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Let's see if this works. There you go. Okay, so um, I'm an environmental economist and agricultural economist by background. So uh, that brings together, if you will, the sciences and the social sciences. And so um, what I'll be sharing with you about food is um, I think very uh, relevant here. Um, food is, um, let's see if my slides work. Yeah, okay, so our, our presentation and our focus on, on food and food systems in this new virtual normal that we find ourselves in in the post-COVID-19 times 
um, is our focus. And we want to focus on three things. We uh, entitled it Down the Rabbit Hole, namely we've already gone down the rabbit hole. And uh, so I'll review our food system and, and uh, how it works right now and what its pluses and minuses are. Um, my uh, esteemed colleague, Benson Cook, will talk about becoming agents of change and then we'll revert back to me to going supernova. And we'll tell you what we, what we mean by this. Um, so, uh, hmm, I don't know, uh, yeah, okay. So food like, like no other sector of the economy, I would submit to you, forces us to focus on the context within which economic activity takes place. Um, and a lot of times we focus only on the economy, but when it comes to food, food connects us to nature because we need to eat in order to stay alive and plants grow and we raise animals as food products. And so it's a direct connection to nature, but food also connects us to culture because our food systems um, are, are very descriptive and say a lot uh, about us as as people and the cultures we come from. Um, if you detect an accent in my impeccable English, I'm originally from Germany. And so I have a very different palette than one of my colleagues who comes from Nigeria, for example, or from Liberia. And, and what is, um, you know, my favorite food is not theirs. I can't take that level of spiciness that, that is totally normal to them. But I'm really into sour because we pickle everything in Northern Europe. That was how we preserve foods. Um, so food also connects us to each other. We love to share meals. We have holiday traditions around meals. Um, and it connects to many other sectors of the economy. When people tell you that agriculture has really become a less important sector, think again. Food connects us to the hospitality sector, to technology, um, all kinds of other sectors of the economy. So it really has a huge impact. It impacts our natural resources and it impacts us very directly as humans in terms of our human health. So typically what we, what we focus on uh, in economics is what I've called the commercial view of context. Namely, if you notice, no context. It's all about the economy. So what these arrows are about is the yellow ones are our social context system and it sort of feeds the economy. We feed it with labor and we feed it with natural resources. And then oops, there are emissions and waste. Yes, we have the intention of producing food, but, well, you know, there are emissions and waste. So these are byproducts. But more recently, I would say, especially since the 1992 or summit in Rio, the summit on environment and development, um, a different kind of concept of the economy has come uh, into focus. And we might call that the three P view, namely, it's still about economics, about profits, but it's also about people and about the planet. And so the context moves more to the foreground in this view of the economy. And as the story goes, we say, if we focus on development, on economic activity, on growing our food, developing our food systems so that we operate in this intersection between these three spheres of the economy, society, and the environment, then we can manage in a sustainable, sustainable fashion. Well, I would, would submit to you that the real view of context is this, because the economy is a social system. It's nested within society and culture. We have cultural agreements, the handshake. Um, we have legal systems that all define our economic interactions. And I have a really hard time thinking of an economy that could operate outside of the environment. Short of, you know, if, even if we settled Mars, we would still need to have resources supporting us from planet Earth as we try to populate the moon or Mars. So I have a very difficult time imagining anything um, that would support an economy and in fact, in fact, a human society that is not nested within the environment and recognizes how nature works and what kind of opportunities and constraints nature presents to us. 
So this is really the more real view of context. Namely, you might say, as much as we think it's all about the economy, it's really not. Um, and we can't envision sustaining an economy without paying attention to society and culture and to the environment. So when we look at food, um, here is what, uh, I don't know why this thing is starting to run by itself, but let me try and go back. Um, it hasn't done that before, so. Um, hmm. Maybe I need to get out of my full screen view here and see if I can circle back. Sorry about this, but it started running on its own. So uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on food and food systems and the, um, in the environment context. And there are huge impacts. 11% of greenhouse gases in the United States stem from food transportation alone. Globally, it's 25% of CO2 emissions that stem from food transportation. 70% of fresh water is appropriated for aquaculture. And aquaculture also releases high amounts of carbon, even though it could actually take carbon out of the atmosphere and, and sequester it back into the soil. Our US food system is especially vulnerable because it's very highly centralized with very long supply chain. And if we think that we've got problems on our hands right now, just think ahead a little bit. By 2040, um, we need to feed, so the estimates go 9 billion people, not 7.2 billion people that we have today. And what we've just discovered is that this food system also connects us to a seasonal workforce that is often low paid, and yet we've just designated it as essential because in this pandemic, COVID-19, that we find ourselves in right now, our food system is essential and the workers that support this food system are essential. So while we may think that we have moved more to a virtual environment where food is ordered online and delivered to our, food, uh, to our doorsteps, think again. This virtual food system is supported by very, very significant material impacts that have nothing to do with virtuality when it comes to the impact on the planet and on, on people. Um, so this is what the social impacts look like. And now we're focusing in on Washington DC and what we've learned about our food system in DC. Um, the USDA has an interesting terminology. It's called food security. And so we talk about families being food insecure. Well, in DC, we have 13% of households that are food insecure. And so think about food insecurity as having sort of two poles to it. One is the quantitative insecurity, where actually 19% of DC households say they experience hardship, where they simply can't get enough food on the table consistently throughout the year. That's a pretty shocking statistic, if you ask me. And it gets even worse for households with children, where 37% are food insecure. And then there is the qualitative aspect of food insecurity. And that says we can't get enough food that is nutritious that supports an active and healthy life. And that becomes a real problem in a pandemic or in any kind of other situation where you're experiencing a shock event. Because when you already have nutritional deficits, high rates of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, then any kind of other shock like the one we're experiencing now with the coronavirus adds tremendous pressure on these populations that suffer from food insecurity in a qualitative manner. So here's some other background from Washington, D.C. Administratively, D.C. is organized into eight districts. We call them wards. And here you see the disparities. Um, the highest household income uh, in, in Ward 3 is, um, where did my slides just go sorry about this i don't know what the uh, technical challenges are here but we're trying to we're going to try and 
overcome them. Um, and I'm going to have to, I think, just fast forward you uh, to that slide. But what I wanted to show you is the tremendous uh, economic disparities within the district with household incomes ranging between 250,000 at the high end and 45,000 at the low end. Um, there are very similar disparities when it comes to uh, health effects. And I'm gonna try and get out of my slides here for a second and see if we restart this, um, if we might be able to forward it again. Uh, I think my slides are, have disappeared. That is uh, interesting. Okay. Um, well, what I wanted to show you is a bar graph that just shows these tremendous differences in obesity and diabetes that then translate as pre-existing food-related illnesses um, that make any exposure to any other health risk even um, more uh, more harsh to deal with. Um, sadly, these also overlap with ethnic and racial uh, disparities in the district, and they range between 78% uh, of uh, non-Hispanic whites in the Ward 3 area where you saw these very high household incomes. And on the, on the other end of the spectrum, you have 95% non-Hispanic black populations in those areas where you saw the household incomes being um, at 45,000 a year. So tremendous uh, disparities. Ah, thank you, Dr. Cook. Okay, if you, yeah, okay, great. That, and then, yeah, and the next slide, uh, thank you. Here you also see not just differences in income, but also in employment. And here is the uh, racial disparities in the district. And then the next slide, I think, shows you uh, the health disparities. There you go. Um, the yellow bar is obesity and the red bar is diabetes. Um, and so these are tremendous uh, disparities in health. And what is really interesting that in this uh, context in which a lot of our activities now have moved onto virtual platforms, like we are here right now at this conference on Zoom, because we can't be in a conference right now person to person. And yet that virtual reality really is supported by drawing on that social and environmental context of our daily activities. And it is that burden is not equally distributed either because the essential workforce, as we've designated it, um, that makes sure our food system runs smoothly um, and our distribution centers are in place, that virtual workforce tends to be low income and non-white. So Dr. Cook, if you, if you just move to the next slide, that'd be great. And I'll illustrate what I mean. So these are, the purple dots are grocery stores, full service grocery stores in the District of Columbia. There you would have relatively easy access if you live within a mile um, you could go to your grocery store, but if you live here in these areas where you saw predominantly African-American populations, um, uh, those are food desert neighborhoods where there is very limited access to full service grocery stores. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this brings then into focus the vulnerability that has been exacerbated in a virtual environment. At the top of that slide, you see the most robust food chain. When you grow some of your own food, you put it on your plate, you know what you put on your plate and you know what you put in your mouth and in your body. Um, and then look at the last two. The supermarkets is already a pretty darn long supply chain. And now we have just added to it in this virtual reality we find ourselves in because now we have added additional transportation. So we've increased the carbon footprint from food transportation and we have added additional distribution centers and processing centers where people often work shoulder to shoulder with very few breaks and very low wages. And so if every handoff point in this increasingly long chain of our food system is a point of vulnerability. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cook. Okay, 
What's interesting about the presentation that you've heard so far is that it really highlights the importance of recognizing that even though we are trained and educated within a certain professional identity, that if we're doing work for the community, it becomes critical that we find ways to step outside of the silo of that professional identity, to collaborate, to ensure that we can provide optimal health, optimal care, optimal resources to the people who live in the communities that we want to serve. At the University of the District of Columbia, this is even more important for us because we are an urban land grant institution. And to me, what that means is the community is looking for us to ensure that when we are engaged in education, when we're engaged in training, that that somehow fits in an inextricable manner with the community at large. I was talking with Dr. Savino here the other day about how I pretty much have been tracking her down for the past four or five years, looking for an opportunity to collaborate. And you may ask, how would that be the case if I'm in the field of counseling and the field of psychology and she in a field that's not within that same domain? It's because the work that I've been doing primarily focused on issues around depression and ha have resulted in, and here you have a slide looking at the first book that I did in 2013 and the more recent book, is evolving treatment approaches, evolving in the context that it becomes important to step outside of the box, step outside of that silo and collaborate with others who can bring additional information, additional insights, additional resources to bear on those populations that are being significantly impacted. In this particular context, the second edition took me to a totally different direction in the sense that building upon the first, I began to recognize the importance of consulting with the nutritionist because food is such an important factor. Consulting with an industrial organizational psychologist, a neuropsychologist, a community clinical psychologist, a rehabilitation psychologist, and people who are in the field of clinical social work to add information in terms of the impact of trauma. So in these works, I find myself recognizing that these works are all important to helping to build up an understanding of the impact of going from theoretical to practical. To do that though, there's a hurdle we have to cross. This is a beautiful slide because it really helps you understand the importance of achieving some kind of equity. Equity that provides a level playing field for all to be able to access the resources that we need. I think COVID-19 has made it crystal clear that this is important. I would suggest for those who might be interested in doing other reading, there was a book that came out some years ago called The Great, in, um, the Great uh, in Influenza, which basically talked about the story of the deadliest pandemic in history by John M. Barry. And in this book, a lot of the things that were happening in 1918, we see ourselves repeating the same thing, which we really don't have to repeat. But a lot of it's centered around the importance of dealing with equity. So here we want to make sure that we increase the level of health for all people. We want to make sure that uh, we value everyone equally as we're doing this, and that we really look at some of the issues that have impacted on um, the social injustices that have helped to uh, foster this issue of disparity. So health equity matters. It matters in the context that we need to understand that it is a basic human right. Uh, when you watch the news and you hear people talk about the importance of being able to have some kind of health care to deal with pre-existing conditions, all of this becomes very important. The same in physical health as it is in mental health. In that particular context, we have to be able to find and achieve a positive impact on the life chances and opportunities that all people have. So we're looking at social factors, which play a very important role in influencing the health status or access for people. So you're looking at social inequities, removing those, institutional um, inequities, which means we have to look at governance that includes power opportunities for the people in the community that are most impacted. And then looking at how we do this, not only nationwide, but region-wide, statewide, county-wide, and municipal-wide. What this then does is it removes many of the risk behaviors, it helps to decrease disease, it helps to ensure that we lower 
lower situations where injuries may occur. And we begin to look very closely at how we can bring down the high mortality rates that are, that are existing. Um, while we live in a country that for the most part is food, food secure, one of the challenges that I think we have in terms of looking at how this impacts on health in general and mental health specifically is beginning to look at ways to increase optimal health. And for me, increasing optimal health means recognizing that we have to deal with this from a mental health perspective. So this next slide kind of teaches you some of the issues that we need to be aware of. Mental health disparities. Only a third of Americans with a mental illness or mental health problem get care. And the percentage of African Americans receiving the needed care is only half of that of non-Hispanic whites, nearly 60% nearly of older Americans. While this was something that I talked about in the first book and the second edition, adding new resources is pretty much the same. It's not gotten any better. When you're looking at mental illness, one of the things that I found very interesting is in the um, first edition, we talked about how by the year 2020, sec uh, depression would be the second leading disease, debilitating disease worldwide, second only to heart disease. Well, it's gotten worse. <laughs> uh, there are studies that have come out that have shown that with um, children and adolescents, suicide rates are rising. Why is that important, suicide? Because that is pretty much one of the manifestations of what happens when you don't manage depression effectively. Another issue, generational illness. Here, major depressive disorder is 1.5 times higher or more common among first degree biological relatives and persons with the disorder in the general population, which really impacts all people, but especially those populations that are more at risk. In this context, it becomes important to look at what we typically do when we're dealing with mental health issues. So if someone comes in with presenting mental illness, let's say in this case, I'll use my specialty depression. So we do talk therapies. Talk therapies are very effective, getting at the core, finding out how people's ways of thinking might influence, finding out how uh, issues of trauma may influence. In the 1940s and 50s, especially 60s, we began to look at treatment medications. Unfortunately, that kind of resulted in us living in a society that thinks that pills are always the solution. Well, research shows that the efficacy of pills alone, medication alone, is not as high as with talk therapy and medication. We found that creating an awareness of the importance of social support systems is always something that we need to look at. Research has shown that it's very impactful. As we come to understand this, we have to look at cultural relevance. There's a way of understanding culture that was put together by uh, Dr. Wade Nobles that kind of speaks to this, I think, in a very powerful way when he talked about that culture is the process representing the vast structure of behaviors, ideas, attitudes, beliefs, customs, language, rituals, ceremonies, and practices that are peculiar to a particular group of people, which provides them with a general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality. This is important because what it does is it gets at the core issue of what we need to be doing in terms of helping people in treatment. We need to understand that not everybody's gonna present the same way. There are some cultures where the stigma associated with being able to talk about what may be happening psychologically, i.e. mentally, is so abhorrent that it's better to talk about somatic complaints. So in some cultures you may have, and you can just look at it from a gender perspective, men might be more willing to talk about a problem with upset stomach or a hip injury or a hip soreness or, you know, my back is hurting than to talk about the fact that they are struggling with something psychologically. So understanding culture provides an additional strategy to effectively engage people. At the same time, biological strategies. There, were time, there was a time where we took our lack of understanding of how the brain works to think that if we cut into it, sliced and diced it, that that would bring about some kind of healing. But we were really only doing more damage. But it was through that lack of knowledge and understanding that we came up with approaches that took us away from shock treatments and took us more to a treatment that is used now when nothing else 
works, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Fewer side effects, very effective. For me, this then took me into another area, understanding that like many illnesses, there is a generational component, i.e. there is a um, component that looks at understanding the role of genetics, hereditary illnesses, that as for physical illness, the same can exist for mental illness. Doing a talk show, I had an opportunity to meet the director of the Genome Project, where I began to learn more about this in 2011. As a consequence, I began to engage in research that would bring me to a better understanding of the things that we can begin to do to bring some effect on this final component, gene expression. This next slide kind of gives you a picture that I'm gonna summarize very quickly. We know our DNA in terms of how it operates in terms of going to family reunions where people talk about the genotype and phenotype. Oh, you got hair like this person. Oh, your eyes are just like this person. Oh, you're you know, this or you're that. Kind of helping to pull together how hereditary works. One of the conversations we may also get into is illnesses that are passed on. What I've learned is that with our DNA, on top of it, our chemical tags, these chemical tags act like an on-off switch. They can make different illnesses accessible or they can make them unaccessible. What intrigued me about this is understanding some of the key factors influencing this process. So the first is health factors. So psychological stress, nutritional stress, environmental toxins can have a significant impact on either cutting the switch on or keeping it off. But also social experience factors, interpersonal relationships, behavioral factors, culturally sensitive issues. And especially if you look at it in terms of critical developmental periods. So understanding something about our history and how it can influence the gene expression, which is what the term epigenomics means, and side note, it's semantics. Some say epigenomics, some say epigenetics. Since I was listening to what geneticists say epigenomics, I say epigenomics. <laughs> so I could be correct in that regard, um, since I'm not a geneticist, becomes really important. So how, do, how does that tie in? Well, let me go back to this slide for a minute. On a personal level, I come from a family where on my father's side, heart disease has been one of the factors that has led to the passing away of my father and all of his siblings. On my mother's side, it was diabetes, which played a role in her passing and her siblings. I currently have in my family an older sister, a twin, and a younger that all suffer from those two. I don't. Does that mean I'm the favorite child, like my parents used to say? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it means that I paid attention to something my mother told me decades ago when she was struggling. She said, son, you don't want this. And I said, well, mama, what do I do? She said, well, I need you to try not, don't drink, don't smoke, eat right, exercise, get your rest, and don't hang around crazy people that stress you out. Now, this was before I became a psychologist. I don't know if she understood the profound information she shared with me. If she were alive, I'd say, mama, what you told me back then is what I'm understanding now with the work that I do. So these were things that became important for me. Now here's where it really, where they say the um, rubber hits the road. For psychologists who step outside of maybe their clinical counseling, developmental silos and kind of put their toes into neuropsychology, you begin to see that there are things that we bring into the body in terms of nutrition through food that play an important role with how our neurotransmitters functions, how our neurons function, how the pathways that impact emotion, affect function. This slide begins to show you that a diet rich in amino acids helps to build up neurotransmitters. The second slide, I'm gonna kind of jump to um, the piece that basically shows you that, and this is this one where medications. So medication, medications keep around what's already there. But amino acids, in other words, the things that we eat build up new supplies to replace what is lost and to improve 
on the total number of neurotransmitters. And this becomes important in terms of what medications do, what as clinicians we do in terms of working with someone to help them find ways of becoming an agent of change in their own optimal mental health. So I'm not a nutritionist, but I've been reading a lot more about it. <laughs> and this slide kind of speaks to when I'm working with a client, but more important when I'm training and educating those who will be doing the work as licensed counselors, licensed professionals. It's that you want the client to engage in the optimal mental health picture in terms of their work. So there are key, some key examples of nutrition and mental health. Um, so I created two short lists. On the left, you see a short list of foods that don't work. On the right, foods that do work. So let's kind of go through this. Processed foods don't work. Why? Because they're foods that are devoid of many vitamins, minerals, and uh, phytonutrient compounds found in plants. Also, processed foods don't work because they're foods grown and harvested in factories. Think about that for a moment. Also, there are foods composed of artificial dyes, preservatives, and synthetic nutrients. Now, I do understand that it's important to provide ways of preserving, but I think when we move to the point of profit over nutrition, over health, over mental health, we come into a dilemma that we have to find a way to resolve in order to sustain optimal health. Another is sugar. Why? Because sugar causes inflammation at the cellular level and is associated with increased risk of depression and Alzheimer's disease. Another quick um, anecdote. Um, about two and a half, three years ago now, I stopped with the sugar. Um, I went to see my ophthalmologist because my pressure was building in my eyes and I had an appointment with my primary care physician. So my ophthalmologist, typically the appointment would always last for about five minutes although I'm paying for the whole hour. You know, put you up to the machine, da, 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 da. Look at this, tell me what you see. Okay, your pressure's building, take this, you know, see you later. See you. For me, it was every six months. Um, so I went to my ophthalmologist and all of a sudden he turned around, this is about a couple of years ago, he said, what have you done? And I'm thinking like, oh my goodness, is he telling me I gotta I got go to surgery or something like that? <laughs> like, what do you mean, what have I done? <laughs> he was like, is it that bad? He said, no, what have you done different? Make a long story short, this, this, this appointment went from lasting for five minutes to 45 minutes. It was a conversation. He said, just tell me what changes you made. I said, well, I stopped eating sugar, cookie, cakes, pie, and candy. I said, I would always, when I would go to Starbucks, my favorite place around the corner from the university, they knew me. They said, hey, doc, and they tell the person at the counter, Give him some coffee for his sugar, because I get a cup of coffee with about 10 to 12 bags of sugar. I would stop by the bookstore because, you know, teaching in the morning, teaching at night, you got to do something to get your energy up. I'd buy me my uh, Mounds candy bar, my dark chocolate Hershey's candy bar. I get my cookies. I get, you know, all of that. Um, long story short, that by telling him this, he said, I was an emergency room surgeon, and you need to know that sugar causes inflammation, blah, 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 blah. Bottom line is whatever was going on with your eye, you reversed it. I'll see you in a year. I said, you mean six months? No, a year. A week later, I go to my primary care physician. She says, what have you done? Now I know the answer. I said, okay. <laughs> I stopped eating cookies, cake, pie, sugar, candy, blah, 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 blah. She, and she said the same thing. I said, wait a minute. Why are y'all telling me this now and not before? And she said, because our diets are kind of, centered around the sugar in almost everything. And to tell somebody to stop may not be the way that they do it. It may not reinforce it. But what you've seen is you've seen weight loss, you've seen all your numbers do a 180. And so, and I feel better, you know? And so now I can go to Starbucks and get a cup of coffee and put a half a bag of sugar and I taste the same as I did for 10 bags. Okay, all that, off of that. Short list, fish. Why? Because it's a brain food. Uh, populations eating fish have the lowest rates of depression. So you're looking at omega-3 fats, ALA, EPA, DHA, that basically our body uses for energy. Looking more at a vegetarian kind of diet, looking at more balanced diets, 
And when I say balanced, I mean including the fruits, the vegetables, and the whole grains, but learning and reading about it so you can do a better job of that. Which brings me to, I think, close to my last slide, titled Re-Traumatization from the 2005 Gulf Coast to the 2019 COVID-19. Now, if I they had read the other stuff about me, I was one of the first African-American psychologists to go in after Hurricane Katrina and Rita and working with some other colleagues develop uh, culturally competent standards that were used by the American Psychological Association, used by the, um, uh, the, um, the other agencies that went in to effectively engage and address these issues, the American Red Cross. And what became important is that this slide shows that one of the biggest issues that we faced was knowing about the impact of race, class, poverty, and inequity when we go in so that we can effectively engage and have people who have a cultural mistrust for what we bring to the table be open to accepting the recommendations that we give that would help to enhance what's going on. With systemic misdiagnosis, it also contributed to the cultural mistrust. The stigma is already there, but you, can, you, you, you add more to it when you don't understand the impact of these particular issues, not only then, but in terms of what we're dealing with now. So it becomes important to talk about this when we're working with populations that represent low wealth populations, under-resourced, underserved populations, where as Dr. Sabino here talked about earlier, people live in food deserts. So how do you get them to engage in the kind of strategies that will increase optimal health care for them? This is what we begin to do. And not just low wealth, high wealth too. <laughs> People don't know what they don't know. And so the importance of this is recognizing that we need to pull this together. And what this does, it creates the kind of social contracts that correct some of the issues around disparities, correct some of the issues around inequities, and support optimal health and optimal mental health care. And with that, we're going to go supernova. <laughs> I turn okay. it back over to Dr. Sabino here out of time so I'm going to walk you through this very quickly because we didn't want to just stop with diagnosing the problem but offering solutions and so uh, next slide please um, we have set out to build a decentralized small-scale food system in Washington DC and we call them our urban food hubs they consist of four components producing the food preparing the food which offers opportunity for value added for these small producers, food distribution, and closing the loop through waste and water recovery. Next slide, please. And we're going to go through these very quickly um, because uh, depending on the location, the food production can look differently. Um, and so you can grow in raised beds if you have soil contamination, or you can grow in nutrient rich water, which is called aquaponics or hydroponics. And you can grow on one of the most underutilized spaces, namely roofs on top of buildings. And we have made all of these different food production spaces in Washington, DC. Food preparation, the second component, adds both value to that produce that you might produce, um, but it also offers an opportunity uh, for nutrition education, cooking classes, and so forth. Um, can you? Pull the next slide up, Dr. Cook. Thank you. Um, uh, so a lot of activities around that, teaching people age-appropriate diets, um, culturally sensitive diets, and so forth. The third slide, please. Uh, food distribution. We typically think about food in the grocery stores or now on our doorstep being delivered through some online services. But what about farmers markets, food trucks, DC had a very robust history of small stores and hucksters is what they called them, food trucks that delivered into neighborhoods. Ethnic restaurants that form direct marketing opportunities for small growers and community supported agriculture where food is delivered um, as a risk sharing element with the small farmers rather than being bought by the pound. You uh, pay a monthly fee or an annual fee and get deliveries of food based on that. And next, uh, last but not least, the fourth component. This is a big bucket of activities from composting and enhancing soil quality to 
turning food waste into energy, uh, to harvesting rainwater for irrigating food systems, to increasing permeable surfaces so that water runoff gets captured in plants and mitigates flooding. And we do all of these things in the neighborhoods that you saw earlier, these food desert neighborhoods. Um, and so these are initiatives that are in various stages of completion to create businesses and jobs um, and to improve environmental uh, criteria, both heat uh, island mitigation and water capture in these urban neighborhoods. And we'll show you where they are. So if you come to Washington DC, we would love to take you around to our urban farms in Ward 7, which was one of the neighborhoods you saw with very high unemployment and very high uh, food uh, related illnesses. In Ward 5 on South Dakota Avenue, in Ward 8, which is way southeast Washington DC. And we do have a demonstration site on our campus too, where you can learn the various practices of growing, preparing food and linking it to green infrastructure in our cities. Thank you all. Thank you both so much, um, Dr. Sohara and, and, and Dr. Cook. Uh, very interesting conversation. So I'm inviting people, our attendees, to start putting um, questions into the chat box. And we have a couple of people, um, including um, Gail Wilson, who are going to be looking for those um, questions as you put them in. And I just uh, want to say that um, that some I'm, I'm a part of some collectives that use the word food apartheid instead of food desert, in part because deserts are naturally occurring. And we know that <laughs> very much, you know, the, the, the way that these neighborhoods end up in the, in the conditions that they are, is actually not naturally occurring. Deserts have plenty of life and plenty of sort of healthy life. And so it's actually sort of a, a put, giving, giving deserts a bad name to, to call this sort of man-made experience that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so hopefully, I mean, I, I know that people probably have lots of questions, but um, that was that was certainly one of the things that I was thinking about. And the other thing, um, as, as someone born in in the district that that I was thinking about, was the very distinct food cultures that exist in a city such as D.C. I mean, I you know I can think about 18th Street and you know Ethiopian <laughs> restaurants. I can think about a Chinatown. I can think about entire blocks that are Salvadorian cuisine. And so you know I, I would be interested to know sort of how you I think about Embassy Row and what that means in terms of um, really distinct sort of deep cultural traditions. But I'm wondering what you think about sort of the the mixed impacts and food cultures about you know if, if we go to an Indian um, an Ethiopian restaurant and people are sort of eating communally, that has very different implications, both in terms of distancing and in terms of, and in terms of hunger, quite frankly, because when people eat communally, hunger plays out differently than, than when, when everybody gets their own plate. And so I'm wondering how you think the distinct sort of food cultures of DC are being impacted at this moment. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, we're writing that chapter, of course, as we as we speak, right? Um, I think your point about ethnic foods is, is really, really important. And we discovered early on that they really provide a great opportunity in urban agriculture. Um, what the USDA calls uh, specialty crops, it's an interesting term in and of itself, isn't it? That's what our vegetables are, they are specialty crops, because the main focus is on commercial crops in agriculture. Um, and then we have ethnic crops, and these are the family within the vegetable family within uh, this designation of specialty crops that are not native to the Americas. And, and they actually provide huge opportunities. So we actually learned and teach people to grow um, particularly West African crops because we have a sizable immigrant community in DC from that part of the world, but also Central America. We work with an organization called the National Latino Farmers and Ranchers 
Uh, they also supply some of our farmers markets to address these needs. And, you know, when you can grow kidley, which the Nigerians will tell you, you'll never have another stomach ailment if you put this very small green eggplant that is quite bitter into your stew, um, then, uh, you know, they fetch actually $12, $14 a pound. So you don't need to have a very large space in order for these ethnic crops to provide real opportunities for these communities. Um, and everybody graves their own tastes and their own uh, cultural, uh, you know, the, the roots that we relate to that taste. And so to be able to offer those fresh rather than frozen or canned is, is a real benefit uh, to these diverse communities. Now, um, we share meals. That's so much part of, of, of so many of our traditions. And right now, we have a tough time sharing meals. Um, I go up um, in my neighborhood. Uh, I've been doing a good bit of takeout, trying to keep my neighborhood places, um, support them in, 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 in some small way, right? But this is going to be uh, quite an adjustment. I think food the way we've known it and the food system the way we've known it uh, is not going to be back. Uh, anytime soon. And you just look at the, the way the tables are now spaced out in our outdoor eating places, right? We all used to huddle together uh, in these places and now we have to stay six feet apart. And, and, and there's good reason why we should uh, stay apart and not endanger um, ourselves or others and most importantly our health workers, right? Uh, who have to deal with the aftermath if we act re irresponsibly. So there are huge implications for that. And I think there will be mental health implications as well beyond the, the what I would call more physical ones related to the food we eat and the quality of food we eat, but mental health implications from just the social distancing that we now experience um, and, and the loneliness associated with that when you can't share a meal or you have to share a meal sitting in front of a screen. And that also becomes another, um, you know, a disparity issue uh, because, you know, we all are sitting in front of our own screens in our homes, uh, but people don't have the same access to this screen sharing technology. It's a hu another huge disparity. And so we've just added um, in this new virtual reality, we've just added another layer of disparities. Um, and yes, thank you also for pointing to the term uh, food apartheid. I'm still stuck with my USDA definitions as the person responsible for land grant programs, but you are very, uh, you, you are very right to point uh, to that, uh, those very discriminating uh, dis connotations of that term. Deserts can be beautiful places and so they are. Should, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, 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 I'll, and I'll just cite that, you know, that, that language, uh, I learned that language from Leah Peniman of, of Soul Fire Farm, and I'll put that information in the in the link, but who, who also in, in her text Farming While Black talks a lot about uh, the historical relationship of African Americans to the USDA and, and farm acquisitions. Uh, so, so I mean, they're, they're, the fact that the, the language is, is sort of in an intense relation sort of makes sense historically, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, and in DC, we have a lot of that history, right? Until the, 1970s, uh, until the 1970s, we had over 300 small, often cooperatively owned uh, food businesses in the district and food carts uh, that catered to very distinct ethnic communities within the district. And then the supermarkets came in and pushed many of these, of these places out. And so there are real implications also for what does that mean for food policy, uh, right? Because why then is policy still so much focused on trying to bring another supermarket in? Why not starting more small scale cooperatively owned businesses in that very robust decentralized economy that we once had in the nation's capital? I didn't know if Dr. Cook, you wanted to Add, add something there before. Oh, I, 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 would the think, I guess the part that I would add is uh, when Dr. Sabino here in her presentation talked about the Im impact of socioeconomic household income 
unemployment. I would also add the educational piece. Uh, I find my work is, my work provides me with an opportunity to go to clinics that are based in the community. These are physicians who have decided to put their clinics right in those spaces where it's needed most. I also go to barbershops, beauty shops, I go to churches. And in many instances, you have people who are looking for information that they may not necessarily get from television or the radio, unless it's some kind of popular entertainer or athlete, but something that kind of speaks to where they are and what they're experiencing given their situation. And in that context, for me, it always comes back to the value of nutrition. And so um, I'm thankful to the work of Dr. Sabina Hare's program when she was serving as Dean, because um, I was working with a um, African-American church in DC, a very large one that was um, uh, fortunate enough to purchase the property around them. And they have a lot of ministries and one of their men, well, they have like a, a homeless ministry, they have a food ministry and things like that. So it's one thing to go out and continue to buy things, but imagine the, the empowerment of being able to plant, grow, harvest, cook, or sell, and then go through that whole process again. It empowers you to be able to then not only do it for the community, but to teach the community how to do it for themselves. Then imagine that you take the people who are doing that, bring them into a community college, a baccalaureate level, master's and now a PhD program to learn how to bring that back even more. So now you're really growing. This is what an urban land grant institution is supposed to do. And so you find now professionals stepping outside of their professional silos to collaborate, you know, and to find ways to really not just listen, but hear the needs of the community and provide the resources that are needed. I think that that becomes another powerful piece that the people can then see the institution, not as some ivory tower on the hill, but as a place and space where their needs are met. Absolutely, and I and I'm 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 very glad that you you talked about people, you know, going to the the communities that are sort of most need, you know, most need the the support of of professionals. Um, and um, and 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 even as as I think about that, I think about sort of the history of, of DC, which is always going to be sort of close in my heart and my thoughts. My 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 father was an op ophthalmologist and, and, and worked at DC General before it was shut down. I'm sure you know some of that history. I mean, right? So I used to work at the Reeves Center. And, and, and so it's interesting when, when there are those kinds of shifts in the infrastructure, the hospital where I was born, Columbia Hospital for Women is now, you know, set of condos, right? So thinking about sort of what are the circumstances that even lead folks to, to sort of up to, to, to living in the context of a food apartheid, I think can be and, really, and really I, instrumental. Yeah. I can hear this point. Yeah. What's important about what you're saying, and I hope the audience gets this, we're there because we want to be. Yeah. We're not there because we are trying to subsidize some grant for people to make more money in their salary. We're there because we're adding this as an integral part of what we believe is essential for being able to create optimal care. And the beauty of it is the simplicity of it, is that we're seeing with COVID that if we don't deal with the least of us, it impacts the most of us. And so here we are recognizing that this is where we want to be because this is where we're needed. And by giving back to this, it helps everybody. So, yeah. Absolutely. Ms. Gail, can you catch us up? Are you following the chat? Can you? Yes, I am following the chat. What do we, what do we have here? I don't have any questions, but there are some comments. Uh, Regina, Absolutely. Um, says that um, she found an extremely interesting discussion, which is a reality in many minority communities. The irony is that many of the people without access to food diversity are the essential workers that go to work in food stores, restaurants available and outside of their own communities. And she goes on to say that also when the supermarkets start to come in, it is often related to gentrification. Yeah. Um, Alina uh, said, thank you for your insights. She appreciate 
the opportunity to hear about your work and research. And, um, and that was it. Uh, yeah, if I may comment on the essential workers, because I think that's a, a really important point. And not only do they work in our supermarkets, in meatpacking plants and so forth, but they also, or in these distribution centers right now that everybody orders online, uh, you, have to, you have to imagine there's now several other handoff points added to it where the stuff gets sent in, repackaged, and out it goes again, right? So, so there are a lot of um, uh, handoff points there and essential workers that are needed to keep that food system going. But also on the farm, we've learned, right, most of our farm workers nowadays come uh, from immigrant communities or from uh, seasonal worker uh, communities that come only for the purpose of picking, uh, I mean, strawberries, right? Or picking uh, avocados or, or artichokes. Um, California is known for its uh, vegetables and fruits and the seasonal workers uh, that come with that. And, and so now we've got sort of a, a, a two pronged conundrum here where on the one hand seasonal workers don't have the same uh, flexibility anymore that we had when we could all travel in whichever direction right um, and so now uh, food is is not being harvested and uh, and we have enormous amounts of food waste that happen right at the farm uh, because we've disrupted uh, the seasonal workforce. And then we have the second prong, Lemni, as you said, or as the, uh, the, the comment stated, um, at, the, at the grocery stores and at the, meat, at the distribution end of things and at the uh, interaction with the consumer. So they're uh, both at the source, if you will, and uh, then at the, at the uh, distribution end, at the consumption end, we have huge disruptions, but both these workforces are very low paid, have very limited benefits, very limited um, safety in their, in their workspace, and yet we depend on them to keep our food system going. And so it really behooves us to rethink when it comes to something as essential as food, how do we produce it? Where do we produce it? Can we decentralize it? Can we bring it closer to where the majority of consumers live? Um, so we, we address some of these very high vulnerabilities. Thank you. There's one question from Sharon. Um, she said, thanks to all, one of the most intriguing panels I have seen. Um, her question is, as media psychologists, how can we help addressing these important issues? So I would say study. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is while my professional identity is psychology, counseling psychology specifically, um, these other areas that I've had the opportunity to, to work in have been areas that I've actually had to kind of hit the ground running in. So I work with uh, geneticists so I can understand more about the epigenome. Then I read what they tell me to read, study it, begin to include it in my research ideas so that I can uh, develop a greater expertise in how it relates to the work that I do. In terms of nutrition, Excuse me, same thing. Uh, I've been reading a number of works, started off with um, uh, journals of psychiatry that are beginning to lean more towards understanding nutrition, started uh, working very closely with the neuropsychologist who made me aware of more of what's happening from a neurochemical perspective, from a biological perspective, how that influences us from a physiological perspective. Um, and then beginning to just reach out beyond that to find some of the books that some of these scholars have written that help us to better understand what's going on. Um, for example, there's a book that I've been recently reading right here, marked up, it's a book that I find really important. That's the book, that's the author of the book. It's uh, The Happiness Diet. Uh, Drew Ramsey is a psychiatrist. He's a, a professor 
um, that uh, focuses uh, on, he's at Columbia University, he focuses on understanding something of, you know, what we need to, to recognize in terms of the detriment of, he has like, I think it's uh, 100 top reasons to avoid processed foods. This is scary, <laughs> but it's very profound in terms of the things he talks about. So um, that's, that's another area. And then collaborate with other people. As I said, I've been, I, when I've talked to her, I tell her I've been trying to run her down, track her down for four or five years, but I would find opportunities to sit in her office and say, you know, we need to do something. We need to do something. And I would tell her about how the work I was doing focused on this nutrition piece. Then I listened to her talk about what she did. And I had to then begin to develop an understanding, ask the questions, what do you mean by this? Help me understand this more. But what I found is that this presentation is kind of a contract that we've made with each other that is going to expand it to some research papers and maybe even some magazine or news uh, journal or other articles uh, that will hopefully expand the knowledge and awareness based upon the curiosity. Folk in the community are curious. So we're not sharing anything that they didn't ask about. The problem is they never get a straight answer. So our goal is to begin to provide that kind of dialogue, communication, we, we're listening and hearing and, and talking about what we know and what we don't know to answer the questions they have about what they can learn that can change where they currently are to create optimal health. And that's why I kind of include anecdotal stuff that happened to me because had not certain things occurred with me personally in terms of family and self, it may not have really hit home as much. But for me, I'm very fortunate not dealing with the blood pressure issues or the heart issues, I should say, not dealing with the diabetes issues, all because I've been open to learning and understanding and reading more. And then I share it. You know, uh, we have um, family, this is the final point. We, because our family can't get together to where we like to, once a month, we do a Facebook family meeting. And the things that I learn, I share with my family. Oh, by the way, y'all, you know, check this out, you know, do this, do that. And then when we get back next month, I'm going to find out how the sugar thing worked with some, some of the family members. So those are the things as a media person that you want to do. You want to continue to engage. You want to continue to learn. Um, <laughs> the more I learn, the more I learn. Okay, the more I learn, the more I understand how much I don't know. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm excited to continually grow in, in, in this time where we are now, I think, using this technology to reach out more, to understand more, to share more, and to grow more. Yeah, I would, I would add, you know, food systems and the, the, the way we've described this idea of a decentralized, more localized food system, it's not so easy to explain. Food is complex. Um, and uh, we've mainly focused on the nutritional aspects, but I saw on the chat there was a question about also the physical benefits in terms of exercise and going out, getting outdoors, getting some, uh, some outdoor space. Um, and that's another benefit of growing some of your own food. And being a as complex as it is, um, I would hope that media people can help us connect the dots effectively. I have yet to figure out what the elevator speech for the urban food hubs is, because even just the four components of them, you know, food production, preparation, distribution, and closing the loop through waste and water management, well, ugh, that's a really complex topic. And so how do you help connect the dots and do it well without, um, you know, so overwhelming people. I think that's a real challenge in terms of uh, communicating some of these systems views that we're learning about how things are connected between economic society and, and the environment. Uh, so I'm looking to uh, media folks like yourselves to help me with this and say, how do we get the complexity um, expressed well um, and expressed in a concise manner that still doesn't lose the importance of complexity. Right. And, and on the point that she made, um, exercise, movement, um, 
not trying to, but I have to say this, in the second edition, as in the first, I really expanded on understanding not just the traditional treatment approaches, but the non-traditionals. Used to be considered alternative approaches, now complementary, because they complement what everyone around the world can do. And expressing it in a language that people can understand, relate to, and implement in their own life. Because the question is, what can I do? What's the first thing I can do? You know, well, one of the first things you could do is move. You can move to, you know, getting you some water. As you're drinking the water, you can move to, rather than the candy bar cook, cookie cake or pie, you know, an apple, move to a banana, move to, you know, strawberries, move to blueberries. I mean, these are things, and, and again, the, the conversation varies depending upon a person's access or resources. But the goal is to have a conversation where we can reach each one, each one teach one, you know. So I think this is a possibility we could do that. And this was the beginning of that. Okay, I have, I do have time to read one more comment. Okay, um, this one is from Cynthia and she says, very interesting discussion. As someone linked to the Food Bank Distribution Center, um, she sees food going through several hands before it reaches the end user, which is a concern. Uh, we are growing food, ICW, uh, the local extension service, mm -hmm. also a great way to help with depression, working with growing food. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. And we've had some uh, experience with that, uh, also with veterans, for example. Um, you know, so the Master Gardening is one of the programs that uh, extension services um, around the country run like we do in our land grant here in, in uh, Washington DC um, and so um, we've added to the master gardening certifications by adding more food production um, and then all the way to do you want to learn how to grow hydroponically or aquaponics where the fish excrement becomes the fertilizer for the plants the plants take out the nutrients the water recirculates and that way you also, you know, the impact on the green economy, that kind of food production uses only 10% of the water of conventional agriculture. So all of these ways of growing food become opportunities to, um, to exercise, to engage with nature, and to learn a whole lot about how nature works because nature tends to work much more in, in, in cycles. And we've made in our food economy, we've made things sort of linear, right? We move from these inputs of fertilizer and water and so forth, and we move to the harvest. Well, that's not how it works. That's uh, how do we close the loop? How can we create a more circular food economy where waste is reduced and whatever waste we have is turned back into resources? And these become really important learning opportunities for people to take charge of their own food and their own health but also uh, to, to get out, to, to get some exercise and to release some stress in, in doing that and engaging with nature in that way. Yeah, a very important, bite, like if I was speaking to that question, I would say a simple solution is instead of the vitamin D or with the vitamin D, go out and get the real vitamin D, which is the sunlight, you know? So being out, everything that Dr. Sabino here said Plus, getting that sun, getting that sunlight is, is so powerful, you know, as opposed to just always staying in. And that's one of the things we're going to have to encourage people in this virtual world. Get out. So if you got to just walk to the front of where you live and walk back, that's better than sitting in the house all day and not doing it at all. Get that sunlight. <laughs> yeah. And well, again, like Go ahead. And there, there are, of course, challenges with the social distancing, right? Because we don't, uh, we can't really afford for people to be reckless either. So even when you go outside, wear a mask, right? Or stay away from people so you don't endanger every, anybody. But, you know, it's also been proven that outdoor spaces are far safer than indoor spaces. And so this is a good time to remember to, if you need to get some exercise, uh, this is the time to go out and take a walk or work in the garden, uh, learn how to grow some of your own food, and that may be a much safer exercise than going to the gym where you are in an indoor space where air recirculates and that's 
um, not as safe as the outdoor spaces. So a lot of things for us to rethink in terms of our food and how it connects us to nature and the outdoor environment. Okay, and one more comment from Cynthia. Um, she said food continues to grow regardless of COVID-19. Yes. The world continues. Yes. Yes, and and so and so we're ju we're just at time right now, and I and I think one of the the, the thoughts that I was having, um, as as people were asking questions and and you all were um, responding to the questions, is just thinking about all the different ways that people are living right now. So um, some folks, unhoused folks, who are getting lots of vitamin D, but maybe not in the, in the, in the ideal circumstances and thinking about multi-generational homes for whom um, isolation is really isolation in groups. Many of us live in, in multi-generational homes and, and, and thinking about distancing that is physical. It might not be as much social distancing, but, but physical distancing and all of that um, and how, how food and how farming and farmers and, and, and our different lives can be happening and, and, and having very different impacts on us, even though it's the same sort of um, set of pandemics. So thank you all very much, uh, Dr. Cook, Dr. O'Hara, Ms. Gail Wilson, um, our, our, our staff members here, Andrea McKenna and Edith Osborne, um, for a, a great panel. Thank you for engaging us all. Um, and I know that you all have a lot more things on the, on the agenda. Um, for the symposium. So I also want to thank the media psychology group for inviting, um, inviting, inviting us from the, from, I'm talking from the HOD side of, of the house, the human organizational development side to, um, to, to be a part of this conversation. And again, thank you both so much for, for engaging us here today. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right.